Please turn with me in your Bibles to the second letter of Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll be beginning this morning in verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. And if you have a scripture journal, I believe you can find that on page 44 of the scripture journal. Yes, 44. And if you do not have one of these, well, before this service began, there were a few left. And if you would really like one, there is one still in my hand. So you could get it right after we are done meeting together. Please come up and grab this. Be happy to give this to you, if that be of help to you. Second Peter, chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Would you stand with me, please? Hear now the word of the Lord. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what we do not know, I ask that in your grace you would teach us this morning. And Father, what we think we do not have, remind us that you have already given it to us in Christ. And Father, what we are not but according to your divine power at work in us, what we should be. For your good pleasure, make us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. And you may be seated. Pastor Matthew, my clicker doesn't seem to be working. dead in her door now. Oh, there it is. Last week we opened up our time together studying the first two verses of this magnificent letter and we, th- and we saw that Peter is urging us to remember the truth. Remember the truth. And so we ended with verse 2 last week by God's grace and it said this, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. And so when you study the Bible, you should be asking questions. Now that's the way to study the text. Ask questions of the text. God's speaking to you. You can ask questions. So when you read that phrase, grace and peace be multiplied to you, what would be a good question to ask? How? How can I experience more grace and more peace in my life? It's a good question to ask, and Peter answers you in the second half of verse 2. In the knowledge of God. He's going to say the same thing in, the same thing in verse 3. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. How do you experience grace and peace in your life? Knowing God. You must know God. And so our task before us this morning is to understand that more fully. What does it mean to know God? And Peter answers that question for us in verses 3 and 4. But before we really dive in, I want to show you why the sermon is structured the way it is. I want to show you that the sermon is structured around the same structure of the text. When you study the Bible, divinely inspired, Peter structures things in such a way so that you understand what he's getting at. So I want to help show you what you should be looking for in these verses. Notice first... 
in verse 2, you see that word knowledge, right? See that word knowledge there in verse 2? The knowledge of God. Now go again in verse 3. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the what? Knowledge of Him. So you have knowledge repeated. You have a repeated word there. That's important when you study the text. Repeated words are emphases. Let's now look for a repeated phrase. Go back to the beginning of verse 3. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us... Now go, to, go down to verse 4. For by these He has what? Granted to us... That's the same phrase, granted to us, granted to us. Now, why am I pointing that out? It's not because my name's in the text. (laughs) It's because Peter, again, is emphasizing something there. Knowledge in verse 2, verse 3, he's granted to us. Knowledge in verse 3, verse 4, he's granted to us. It's the same language. Knowing God. Knowing the truth about the holiness of God that we sang about this morning. Knowing the truth about your sin that we sang about this morning. Knowing about the sufficiency of Christ Jesus to pardon and cleanse you from all of that sin that we also sang about this morning. Knowing God. Experiencing conversion is something that is given to you. It's granted to you. If the knowledge of God wasn't granted to you, you wouldn't know God. You don't have the capacity to know God apart from His divine power enabling you to do so. So those phrases, knowing and God granting, are absolutely linked together. You can't divorce them. Peter makes that very plain with just the structure of his text. Without his divine power at work in you, there is no knowledge. There is no granting of his precious and magnificent promises to you. And that's the other observation I want to point out before we dive in. I want you to pay attention to how many times the pronoun his or he is used. What's the object of this Part of the text. Beginning of verse 3. His divine power. End of verse 3. His glory and excellence. The middle of verse 4. His precious and magnificent promises. Do not miss the emphasis. His. 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 Knowing God. Experiencing grace and peace. Is all from Him. It's all based on His power, His character, and His word, His promises. You hear that? His power, His character, and His word. So that means that apart from knowing God, there is no power at work in you to live a godly life. It is impossible to live a godly life Unless you know God. That might might sound simple. We don't live like that. We don't treat our co-workers like that. And Peter wants you to take this very, very seriously. Why is Peter emphasizing his divine power, his character, his promises, his word? Why is he making that kind of emphasis? Because if you look in verses 5 through 7, really 5 through 11... If you look at the next chunk of verses, what's he going to do in those verses? He is going to call you to action. He's going to call you to say, here is how you are to act when you know God. Here's how you're to act as a Christian, as one born again. Here are the fruits of a life with divine power at work in them. Here's what it looks like in verses 5 through 11 to escape the corruption of the world that is by lust And to be a partaker of the divine nature. That's what verses 5 through 11 are all about. And none of those things in verses 5 through 11 are possible. Not a one of them. Apart from Him. 
apart from his power, his character, his word. You can't supply, like it says in verse 5, you can't supply moral excellence and exercise self-control and persevere in godliness unless God has first done the work of making you born again. If you don't have his divine power at work in you, the only works that you will ever succeed at doing are dead works. So that's why he makes it plain in verses 3 and 4 To live a godly life apart from him is vanity. You can't do it. You must know his power. You must know his character. You must know his word, which is all you need to live a godly life. So let's dive in there then. First, his divine power. His divine power. His divine power, Peter says, has granted to us everything we need to live a godly life. Everything you need, God's power, God has granted to you through the knowledge of Him. Everything you need. Not your power, His power. And our text this morning again tells you His divine power works through the knowledge of Him. So I know it's going to be repetitive, but I have to say it because this is the main thrust of the text. If you don't know God, you can't live a godly life. It would be the equivalent of asking a TV to turn on and obey you, and it's not plugged in. No matter what you ask the TV to do, it will not do what you ask it to do. It has no power. The way to live a godly life is to know Jesus Christ. To be converted by his divine power in the gospel. That's Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the what? The power of God to salvation. It's what gets you saved. The gospel is what gets you saved. It keeps you saved, and it brings you all the way home to glory. You don't ever outgrow your need for the power of God in the gospel. You don't. Some people think that the gospel just gets you in the doorway and you move on to bigger and better things. That is an abomination. The gospel is what gets you saved, keeps you saved, and brings you home to glory. His divine power through the gospel, His power is at work in all of those who've been born again. So I just want you to think about that. The same power In Genesis chapter 1, the same power that said, let there be light, the same power that created everyone and everything, the same power that holds all things together by a simple word, the same power that was at work in raising Jesus up from the grave is the power that God has granted to be at work in you, Christian. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says the exact same thing, but God who said light shall shine out of darkness, the same God who spoke in Genesis chapter 1, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of Christ. Same power. Through the gospel of Christ. Just think about another part of the Bible. John chapter 11. Jesus says these words outside of his friend Lazarus' grave. You remember that? He said, Lazarus, come forth. And what did Lazarus do? Did he kind of like, ah, we'll see? Nah, try again tomorrow. God Almighty spoke words and things happened. His word, his power did not return void. His power is undefeated. His power is irresistible. It always has been. It always will be. So did deadness win the day for Lazarus? No. Jesus said, Lazarus come forth. You know what Lazarus did? He hopped right up. So you think about Lazarus. And you think in a a way infinitely better than that. Lazarus had to die again. But in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, 
seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. You were called by God. And this isn't some kind of general call that Peter's talking about. This is an effectual call. God has said to you in your spiritual deadness and your corruption, sinner, come forth. Be made alive. And what happened? If you know God, you came out of the spiritual grave in an infinitely better way than Lazarus, an eternal, forever lasting way, all because of the Son. And that's true of you, friend. That is true if you're in Christ. You are alive. You're not dead anymore. There's a power at work in you. Everything you need to live a godly life is yours. It's been purchased for you with the precious blood of His Son. His divine power. And let me just say, that's a true reality regardless of how you might think. Regardless of how you might feel. Right? You might feel this morning that your spiritual state is just, ah. Uh. If you know Christ, feelings don't get to dictate the truth. This is true for you in the Lord Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Christ, if you don't know God, this isn't true for you. So here's the truth for those who know God, who have trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Here's, here's the truth. You know this text, Ephesians 2. And you were dead, past tense, in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them you too formerly lived in the lust of your flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved you, even when you were dead in your transgressions, he made you alive together with Christ Jesus by grace you've been saved. And he raised you up with him and he seated you with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You tracking with that? You tracking with that, church? If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. With God, God working in you now. Sin is no longer the master over you. God is. God doesn't just come in and renovate. God doesn't come in and just make you look a little better. He doesn't just add on. He demolishes and then makes you new. That's the truth of the gospel. He doesn't tidy you up a little bit. He doesn't help you along. He makes you new. Beloved, God is at work in you with power. And that should change everything about the way you view your sin. You fight it now. You can fight it. And you can win. You actually already have victory sealed for you. God's power is at work in you not so that you might put to death what is earthly in you, so that you will put to death what is earthly in you. The power is already there. It's already fully granted to you because you know God. I think the rapper Flame, going to throw in a little Christian rap from time to time, keep us culturized. The Christian rapper Flame says this perfectly and let me quote him for you. Do you even have a clue what happened to you when he died? When that tomb got rolled, when he rose in the sky? I think we emphasize sin so much that it leaves us paralyzed and glorify struggle so much that it leaves us terrified. But we de-emphasize the fact that we have been sterilized from our old lives and we can start thinking otherwise. We got to snap out of it. We ain't in no straitjacket. We free. When Jesus died in our lives, something strange happened. 
He gave us power. Yeah, I know that we're sinners, but since he rose, he's renewing the image of God in us. We got to start making war. We got to start saying no to those fleshly impulses that Jesus Christ has already paid for. All I got to say to that is amen. His divine power cannot be opposed. Hear this, church. There is there are no chains. There are no habits. There are no addictions. There are no straitjackets in your life that can hold their own against God, against the omnipotent one. And this all-powerful, omnipotent one is at work in you if you belong to him through faith in Christ. So what does that mean? You don't need to go to Barnes & Noble and get a self-help book. Unless it is the B-I-B-L-E. You don't need to go out and get a life coach. If you've got some kind of hard to break sin issue. I've got an addiction. I've got a a sin issue I've got to work with. You don't need self-help. You don't need a life coach. Rather, you need to know God. You need to know God. You need to know His power. So if you go out and you get a self-help book or you get a life coach and those books, that Life coach, if they don't immediately turn your eyes to Christ crucified, risen, and reigning, useless, foolish. That's what people dead in their sins do. So instead, look to the Son. Look to His Word. Know Him. Trust Him. And in so doing, in the looking, in the trusting of Jesus, He is at work in you in power. And what a power at work in you. I mean, what a person at work in you. There's literally no one with more authority. There's no one with more power that could be granting to you all that you need for life and godliness. Right? Undefeated. Again, that should change everything about the way you view your life. should change everything about the way you view your sin and the way you view God's calling on your life to live a holy life. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. I want you to notice, second, that God's power which is is granting you everything you need for life and godliness, is not according to your character. It doesn't hinge on your character, but His. His own glory and excellence. Look at the end of verse 3. You have all that you need for a godly life through the true knowledge of Him who called us what was the reason for the calling? You've got to ask questions of the text. He called us. Why did he call me? Why did he call me? Do you t- Peter, do you tell me? By could be translated because. Because of his own glory and excellence. God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light from death to life. He did that calling, his saving of you. He did all that not based to not based on any kind of attractiveness within you. Not based on any kind of beauty in your deadness. No, no, no. He did this because of his beauty, his goodness, his character, not yours. His glory and excellence, not yours. I love that, his glory and his excellence character of God, God the Father. Just think about this. God the Father paid for you, Christian, at the cost of his son's life. He has stamped you, he has stamped his name upon you to the degree that you are his possession, you are his workmanship, his new creation in Christ Jesus. So do you think that God your Father is going to pay such a price, such an infinitely valuable price, the blood of his son, do you think he's going to pay such a price, he's going to begin such a work in you, he's going to stamp you with his own name and then just let it go to the wayside? He's just going to, well, no. Is that consistent with his character? 
His glory and excellence demands that he doesn't let you just go to the wayside. He isn't the kind of father or the kind of husband that we sometimes are, men. Look at our children, look at our wives. Hey, well, yeah, I'll get to that. I'll get to that tomorrow. I mean, just, 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 just recently. I, need, I, sp- I should have shoveled. I should have shoveled. I'm going to do that tonight. I forgot. God's not like that. You know, a, a month later, we've promised to do something and we don't touch it. God's not like that. His glory, his excellence is on the line in your life. He has stamped you. He sealed you with his Holy Spirit. He has declared this one, this, this person is mine. And so since he's the author, he is himself the author and perfecter of your faith, his glory is on the line in your life. So if you don't, preserve, if you don't persevere to the end, if as one of his children stamped with his very name, if you don't get to the end, if you get forsaken, God doesn't get the glory does he? He's not glorified in that because he didn't see it through. I mean, if you don't experience progressive victory over sin in your life, if God's, if God's name is belittled because of the sin in your life and it's never dealt with, he doesn't get the glory. If you remain a slave to your sins and your addictions, God isn't shown to be excellent. So let's make something very, very plain. God is absolutely committed to his own glory. He's absolutely committed to it, so he will not let his name be dishonored. He will not permit his glory to be diminished in his own workmanship. And so his very character, his very glory and excellence demands that the work that he's began in you, which is tied to his glory, must be perfected in the end. God is going to see you through, beloved, because of the excellence of his character. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will create in you a heart that yearns to put to death the deeds of the body. More and more into the day of Christ Jesus. Why? Because his character is on the line. If he doesn't do it, what he promised to do, he won't be shown as glorious. He promises to do these things because of who he is, because of his faithfulness, even in the midst of our own fickleness. And that's why you can bank on his promises. That's why you can bank on his promises. That's why his promises are so precious and magnificent, the text says, because they're all true. They're all true. It's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to change. He's immutable. For him to lie and for him to change what he said that he was going to do would be contrary to his own glory and excellence. And so when he makes a promise for the sake of his glory and excellence, for the sake of his character, his attributes, he must keep them. He will keep them. He'll keep all of them towards you, Christian. You just think about throughout history. Let's just think about history for just a moment. The promise of a Messiah in Genesis chapter 3. That happened. And then that promise gets more and more clear in the Old Testament. Years, years, hundreds, thousands of years until the Messiah comes. It doesn't seem like there's any human, there's, there's no way that what God said could be true. It's just been years. It's been so long. God delivered. God delivered. And so in Christ now, it's been a couple thousand years since Christ came. Has he not proven himself or and or? His character demands that all of the promises of God are true for you. All of them. And that's why verse 4 begins the way it does. Look look in verse 4. For by these... For by these, by what? What what are the these? What what are the these in verse 4? His glory and his excellence. 
Right? He's, he's given you everything you need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these, by his own character, because of his own faithfulness, because of his attributes, because of his glory and excellence, he has granted to you precious and magnificent promises. And that's our final consideration this, this morning. Notice again, his power, his character, and his word, his precious and magnificent promises. Let's just read verse 4 again. It's so good. For by these, according to the character of God, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. And by the way, where do we find the precious and magnificent promises? Right here. Right here. In the word of God. He's granted you his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So I want you to consider for just a moment the, the character Golem. I hope you know him. Some of you do. Golem is this scary kind of creature in the Lord of the Rings series. Who um, He is obsessed with the ring of power. And it just destroys him, right? I mean, he holds this thing so, it's so precious to him. The ring, the very thing that just slowly sucks his life away and it ends up killing him. He holds it absolutely dear and precious. And it just holds an absolute power over him that he cannot escape and it kills him. And the very thing that he holds precious ends up costing him his life. He calls the ring his precious. Isn't Gollum an illustration of who you used to be as a slave in your sin? Before you were converted... You called the very things that enslaved you, the very th sin that would see you to eternal damnation, it was precious to you. Until the day God, in His divine power, through His great mercy, according to His glory and excellence, until the day that He destroyed the power of your sin and the penalty of it. And in that moment of conversion, the very things you used to call foolish, the cross, a crucified Savior, your desperate need for grace, those things that were so foolish to you became the most precious things in the world. And instead of sucking your life away, in a way completely opposite of Gollum, the promises of God, now precious, were life-giving. Only the power of God at work in someone, in work of each of you, beloved, only the power of God can make His promises that you used to despise when you were perishing. Only the power of God can turn them into precious, I can't live without them, promises. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And that's what Peter's talking about in verse 4. Hear this. That should be an absolute assurance for any of us in here that are dealing with the assurance of our salvation. Ask the question, are the promises of God precious to you? Are they precious to you? That reality of seeing His promises as precious is impossible for dead people to know. You cannot experience the reality of God's promises being of indescribable value to you unless through the power of God you've been made alive. Only if you know God can such a thing happen. Precious. But not just precious, it says. What's the other describing word? What's the other adjective? His promises are also magnificent. That could be translated very great. But magnificent is even a ma more magnificent word. <laughs> magnificent. Uh, Spurgeon is unmatched here. Let me, let, me, let me quote him for you. He writes this. Magnificent and precious, two words 
that do not often come together. Many things are magnificent that are not precious, such as great rocks, magnificent rocks, which are of little value. On the other hand, many things are precious that are not magnificent, such as diamonds and other jewels, which cannot be very great, cannot be very magnificent if they're very precious. But here we have promises that are so magnificent that they are not less than very precious, infinite. They are not less than divine. They do indeed exceed all things which, which they can be compared. None ever promised as God has done. Kings have promised even to half of their kingdoms. But what of that? God promised to give his own son and even his own self to his people. And he did it. Princes all around the world will draw a line at least somewhere. But the Lord sets no bounds to the gifts that he ordains for his chosen. Wow. Church, you have all that you need to live the life that God has called you to live right here. Right here. In the knowledge of God. Right here in his precious and magnificent promises contained in his word. And so Peter ends verse 4. Through these promises, you are a partaker of the divine nature. That's interesting, isn't it? It's actually how we began verse 3, isn't it? His divine power, his divine nature. You're a partaker of that. That's just another way of saying Galatians 2.20. It is. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's huge. Your old nature hung on the cross with Jesus. Your old nature hung on the cross with Jesus. It's crucified. It's probably still waving in the wind. It's dead. Christ is within you now. Now you are a partaker of a new nature. So some of us are going to struggle with what I'm about to say. When you were dead, you were depraved. When you are made alive in Christ, you are not. Total depravity is for the lost. When God regenerates, you are not depraved anymore. That's the truth. In fact, you can't even say you have a sin nature. You can say all you want, I battle with sin. Absolutely, but is your nature the same as when you were lost? What were you when you were lost? You had a what nature? Go ahead and say it. Okay, now it says you are a partaker of the divine nature. You cannot say that your nature has remained unchanged. To quote Paul Washer, if you get smoked out there by a Mack truck and you come in here and you say, I'm fine, one of two things. You're a liar. Actually, that's the only thing. You're a liar. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're a liar. There's no way that you got smoked by a Mack truck and it didn't leave you altered. How much bigger is God Almighty when he hits you? You are a partaker of the divine nature. The Spirit of Christ lives within you now. And I just want to say, the Spirit of Christ doesn't mess around. Just look at the Gospels. Do you see Jesus messing around? Just playing, playing games? That's not God. God doesn't play games. He doesn't enter into your life and just play some games. Kind of do some work. That's not the character of God. That's not his glory. It's not his excellence. All of this is based on his character. He's going to see you through. You are a partaker of the divine nature today so that in the day that you step into glory, as wonderful as right now to be a partaker of the divine glory, on the day you enter into glory, it's the most wonderful thing to you because He's wonderful to you now. How much more so will he be when you see him face to face? Your nature has changed. So I want to encourage you, beloved Christian, stop hiding behind that unfinished phrase. We're all sinners. That's an unfinished phrase. Say the whole thing. Yeah. You are a sinner, but you are a sinner with Christ in 
you declared to be a saint, that should have a profound effect on how you understand the victory that is yours in Christ. You cannot say, I'm a sinner. Keep, keep going. I'm a sinner saved by grace with a power at work in me that's undefeated. That changes the way you live your life. You can say this, Christian, I'm born again. I'm not born of flesh and blood, but of the Spirit because of the divine power that is at work in me through the promises of God. So you know what? Sin has lost its power over me. It simply has. I don't have to obey sin anymore. It doesn't hold dominion in my life. So live in light of that. There is a greater power at you, in you, that has snuffed that old power out. God's power. And he made you his child, and thus you experience that power from the divine in your very nature. In your very nature. Don't gloss over that phrase, become partakers of the divine nature. But notice also the last phrase, you have escaped the corruption and the lust in the world. Okay, so what is he, what's, he, what's he saying? Through the promises of God, you have a new nature, you're set free, and so walk out of the jail cell. Walk out of the jail cell called corruption. Right? Peter would know this, didn't he? Right? Peter, Peter knows, I mean, he, the, the very author, that happened to him in Acts chapter 12. Remember that? Right? He's languishing in prison, probably going to die, because they just killed some of the disciples earlier in the book of Acts. Herod's going to kill him. Death. It's a great picture. Shackles come out. Boom! Shackles gone. And he hears those words, get up. Get up. The Lord Jesus calls you just, as, just the same. Get up, Christian. I've set you free. So I think the way we want to end our time then is, okay, if he set me free, I have a new nature. If I'm set free from the jail cell, corruption no longer has its, holds dominion over me. I still battle with it. How do I do that? How do I put to death the corruption, the sin that still seems to hang on, even though it's been defeated? How do you put to death that which is earthly in you? And so just a, for just a few moments, I want to make it a little bit more practical, a little more, appli- a little more applicable. That's <laughs> a hard word. How do these things work, it, work themselves out in my life? It's huge. How do you put to death which is, or what is earthly in you? And here's the answer. By taking a hold of the promises of God. As Piper says, you fight the inferior promises of Satan. You fight the inferior promises of the world, the flesh, and the devil. You fight their promises that are so inferior, so hollow, they never even deliver. You fight inferior promises with the superior promises of God. The promises that are never failing, unending, superior. So, brothers and sisters, when evil thoughts enter into your life, enter into your heart, enter into your mind, let's just say perhaps you're at a computer screen, you're on your phone, you're on an iPad, and you start to entertain the promises that evil holds out to you. Right? Right? This will make you happy. You know, just that little click, just a few moments viewing that image. You're going to be so satisfied. And as you hear what lust pathetically offers to you, run, flee to the promises of God, which are far better. Memorize Verses like Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You memorize that verse, and in the moment of of temptation, you run to that and you say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If if there's purity in my heart, I'm going to see more of Him. And the one I'm going to see is the one at whose right hand there are pleasures forevermore. In him there is fullness of joy. Those are promises. When you look at sin, it just looks pathetic. Next to the fullness of joy, you've got a cockroach, a diamond. Fight fire with better fire. 
and you have this fire burning within you, men and women alike, fight the fire within you with the brighter and hotter fire called the precious and magnificent promises of God. So any addiction, alcohol, drugs, some fetish, pornography, any addiction that you can't seem to break, and probably this morning you're, you might be saying, <clears throat> You're saying his divine power is at work in me and yet I'm still stuck in this. It doesn't seem I can get get out of the rut. God's answer to you is very simple. You have all that you need to stop. You have all that you need to not be stuck anymore. I have given you all that you need to live a life full of grace and peace, full of joy through my promises. So if that's you, Christian, I think that's all of us on some level, consider the promises of God. Let me just give you a few, okay? Consider his promise in James 5.16. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. It's a promise of God. Confess your sins, pray for each other, healing. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful, he's righteous to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. To cleanse you. Consider 1 John 1, 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with him and with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You can just consider the peace that God holds out to you in those verses. Cleansing of sin, having fellowship with one another, having fellowship with the very author of joy. Those are good promises. Live in light of those promises. Drag your sin into the light. Put it out in the open. Invite trusted, key word, trusted brothers and sisters in this congregation, in your life. Invite them into it. Drag it out into the light that the UV radiation called honesty would hit it. The glory of God would shine in your life. You'd experience victory because you're taking God's promises to the bank. You know what would happen in their lives too? They'd experience victory too as they'd be encouraged to do the same, trusting the promises of God. Now, I've, I've heard Ryan Fullerton, a pastor, he says, he says something similar to this, I'm paraphrasing him. I can't promise, I want you to hear this, I can't promise you that if you get real and you get honest about your sin and you drag it out to the light, I can't, I can't promise you that your spouse won't leave you. I I can't promise, I can't promise that your spouse, I would hope by the power of the gospel if they're a believer, they they stay, they work with you, but I can't promise that. I can't promise that there won't be strife between the two of you. I I can't promise that um, if you get real about your sin, drag it into the light, that you won't get fired from your job if that's where the sin is happening. I can't promise you that. I can't promise that there won't be real and serious effects from the sins that you've given yourself to. I can't. But God can promise something. God does promise something. You'd get Him. You'd have Him. You'd have God. Wouldn't that be the best? The one, the one person, the one, everyone else has to leave you. You know that? I'm sorry, it's, just, it's hard to think about. Um, uh, Josh, Josh's dad. Um, everybody has to leave you um, at the doorway of death, except for one. There is one that doesn't leave you, and you could have him. You could have him. Well, that's a superior promise to me. 
you would have God. You know, lust isn't the only sin, right? It's just one of many. Think about, I can't tell you the number of times that Carissa and I, when we were battling um, worry and anxiety in our hearts and um, how we've gotten out a hymn book and we've sang songs to one another, especially when we're on the road. You know, Jesus told us don't be anxious and so we want to put that to death within us and, and so we sing and, and why should we sing? Why would we sing songs? Because songs are really good songs. Really good songs are just a string of promise after promise after promise after promise, just pearl after pearl after pearl. You sing to one another precious truths about who God is and what he's promised in his word. And, and so when we when we'd start to worry and start to be anxious, um, we sing together. And so you think about a song you might sing. And one of the songs that we like to sing a lot is that sweet, sweet song, real simple, God will take care of you. You know that song? God will take care of you. Through days of toil, when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When danger's fierce, your path is sail, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, he will take care of you. God will take care of you. And then you start to sing that song and you think about the promises there in that simple song and as you sing that song, you maybe you're in the car and you look out the window and you see birds in the sky. Oh. And you look down and you see flowers. Wow. And then you see weeds. Stinking weeds. All over the place. And you say, God even takes care of the weeds. Seems like the weeds are growing the best. <laughs> And then you think about that promise from Jesus. How much more so will he take care of you? His child, purchased by the blood of his son. How do you get more grace and peace in your life? Through that, the promises of God. Grace and peace multiplied in your life through the knowledge of God found ultimately in his word, his precious and magnificent promises. So let me end our time together with a quote from my favorite book outside the Bible, The Pilgrim's Progress. And if you haven't read that, every time I quote this, I always encourage you, please go get it from the library. We even have a modern English version of it. You should read this book. There's a scene in the middle of Bunyan's work where Christian, he's locked in a cage in a castle called um, Doubting Castle. And there's a giant that guards him. It's giant and he torments him every day. The giant's name is Despair. He torments him day after day, and when all hope seems lost, listen to what happens in Christian's life. I, and I quote, Now a little before it was day, good Christian, as one half amazed, broke out into this passionate speech. What a fool am I. I lie in a stinking dungeon when I could walk at liberty. I have a key in my bosom called promise that will, I am persuaded, open any lock in this doubting castle. Then said hopeful his companion, that's really good news, brother. Pluck it out of thy bosom and give it a try. And then Christian pulled it out of his bosom and began to try it at the dungeon door. And as he turned the bolt, as he turned the key, it gave back. And the door flew open with ease. And Christian and hopeful went out. The key called promise. The way out of despair. There's always hope, Christian, when you have the keys from the king of kings. Amen? So friends, I want you to hear this and I'll be finished. Know the truth. And Jesus says, the truth will set you free. And you know what else Jesus says to you? I am the truth. Father in heaven, we have all that we need in the power of the gospel through the knowledge of your son. Make us a people. As that hymn says, make our lives the same as that hymn. We, ro we, we, we rose, went forth, and we follow thee 
as our chains fall off. Thank you for your precious and magnificent promises. Continue to give us eyes to see them as beautiful. For your glory's sake, for the sake of your excellence and our good. Amen. All right, let's sing some songs together.